Um, I'd like to start before you came to Cornell, because as one looks at your life path, it's, it doesn't appear to be a straight line. So I'd like to focus on those inflection points or mm -hmm. events or experiences mm -hmm. that pointed you uh, at a, a fork in the road and you took a path that may not have seemed the obvious one given mm -hmm. your background, mm -hmm. right? Um, so you started out, um, your first university degree was in German studies. Yes, uh-huh. Um, at some point, you worked in the OECD library. Mm -hmm. I wonder if that glimpse of library was at all involved in your ultimate career choice. Well, I would like to say yes, because that would make it kind of uh, consistent, but I, I'm not sure, because I was uh, just doing serials, checking, helping out. It was a summer job for me as a student. So I just happened, it was nice because it was an international organization, but I cannot really say in the truthfulness. So uh, what, what uh, attracted me to librarianship came later and it was more by accident. So, um, you know, I, I studied German because I, at the time, I wanted to be an interpreter in the European Union. So then I switched to law and I thought I would be a legal interpreter. But then I studied in Germany and I met the person who became my husband, Stuart Pazewski, and um, he was American, so we met in Germany, so our first lang language was German, but then he went back to Colorado, I went back to Paris, and then we kind of kept in touch, even though there was no internet, and then I was probably a little bit more adventurous than he was, because I'm the one who went to the United States, and I, I finished my law degree in Paris, and then I was offered a fellowship to study law in Louisiana, and as you know, it's a partly a civil law country, a civil law state. So I did my studies in, uh, at uh, LSU, and then I moved to Denver, and we got married. And now we've been married almost 40 years. So that, uh, and as I said, we had a long distance uh, relationship without the internet, very romantic. So when so I moved- you, you met Stuart uh, at the University of Erlangen? Huh? Exactly, Erlangen-Nürnberg, yes, during before, my semester. Before there. you got your uh, first bachelor's degree? Yes, I was uh, 17 at the time. I had passed my baccalaureate a little when I was 15. And in France, you can study law directly after your baccalaureate, but I studied German because I wanted to travel, and that was a good opportunity, yes. And you, you taught German? For a while. I thought, yeah, you've done a lot of good research <laughs> because I taught uh, German in a high school while I was going to law school. Yeah, yeah, I was a substitute teacher. So, uh, and my students were, they gave me difficult classes because I was young, I was 19, and my students sometimes were close to my age. So they were, they were a little difficult, but that was good experience for me. So, so yeah, so I, I studied in, um, in Paris. Then I studied in Louisiana. Then I moved to Denver. We got married because Stuart is from Denver. And then they, that's how I got into librarianship because when I was at LSU, there was a wonderful librarian. Her name was Kate Wallach. She had a doctorate from Germany, but she had come over to the US because of the Nazi regime. So, and then at LSU, she had become the head librarian. And when I was working on my thesis, she, um, all of a sudden I had an office, I was an LLM student, and she brought all the books for my thesis. So she did all the research for me. And I thought that was just uh, fantastic. And when I got this uh, uh, American law degree, and I had the French law degree and the German degree, I was thinking, what, how can I enter a career in the US? And I hadn't taken the bar either in France or in the US. So then maybe I thought maybe librarianship would be a good avenue for me. So that's how, when I moved to Denver, there was a program in law librarianship, and if you had a law degree, it went pretty fast. So I did that program and got a master's in law librarianship. So was Stuart at that point also on the librarian path, or no, did that happen he was later? A, he you, was a you teacher. You led on that particular. Yes, exactly. He was a teacher. Oh, yeah. Yes, yeah. So, uh, um, yeah, that's so. I had, um, yeah, I had written my. A thesis on something that you may not be familiar with. It's an old civil law concept. It's called redhibitory vices, redibish, action in redhibition, which is when you buy a car and it turns out to be a lemon, it has defects in it, then you can do that action. So I did a comparison of Louisiana law 
French law and the UCC. So that was my contribution. Mm -hmm. So then uh, moved to Denver, get the degree. And then I didn't know exactly you know, where to find a job that would combine law and librarianship. But my husband had a degree from Duke. And he said, why don't you apply blind? So I sent a letter of application, and they just had a job opening. So we traveled. We had a little uh, Volkswagen. Uh, Stuart had a little uh, beetle, like orange. So we took our belongings. They could all fit in that little car. And we traveled all the way from Denver to Duke. So that was kind of a, my you know, people dream of uh, traveling through the various states of the US. And we did that. That was very nice. And then we got to Duke. And that was in 17, um, 1977. So that was the beginning and of my you career. You were there from 77 until you came here in 93. Yes. And you, um, you rose through the ranks at, at yes, Duke. Uh -huh. In other words, you yes. began as a mm -hmm. reference librarian, mm -hmm. senior reference librarian. Mm -hmm. You also taught there, right? Yes, uh -huh. yeah. I worked uh, under uh, Dean Paul Carrington and Dean Pamela Gunn. And it was at the time where schools, law schools, were expanding their uh, international law programs. So I started uh, teaching. And they, they could see that I had uh, both law degrees you know, from France, from the US, uh, language capabilities, because I knew German. So they asked me to teach. I, I started a course in um, international and foreign law research, but I also started tutoring international students in the basics of American law. And I even taught a course in comparative law. And so, that, so, that, so you see, that was always what I've done um, in my job. I've combined being a librarian and being a comparative law scholar. So I think that has been kind of a good combination for, uh, for me and for my career and for the schools I've worked for. Duke built its um foreign student involvement during that period of time, did it? In other words, so it was scaling up the number of foreign yes. students that it did. and what had happened is um, uh, former President Nixon, Richard Nixon, is a law graduate. And what he had done, uh, you know, I know he had some problems as president, but he, he did open up uh, the US to China. And one of his things was to maybe establish some fellowships to have uh, Chinese students come to Duke. So we had, a, and Duke was one of the, fir the first schools to have Chinese uh, students trained. And one of them actually is now very big in the stock exchange. And his wife, then he got a divorce, but his wife babysat our son. So, so I did have lots of uh, exposure to the international students, yes, at that time. And I would teach them too, yeah. As you say, your career involved continuing your exploration of comparative law as well mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. being a, a librarian. Was Duke a good place to be doing that at the time? Yes, it was. It was. And uh, I had a, a great, we had a great friend, Professor uh, Kazimierz Szybowski, who was a Polish judge and who had also come to the US because of the war, worked at the Library of Congress and was a comparative law teacher and a scholar and uh, he took us under his wing. So we had great personal friend friendly relationships, and he also helped a lot. He, you know, he, I did uh, comparative law research for him. And so there were several, several professors who did uh, uh, international and comparative law. And the um, uh, master's degree, the LLM program, was developing at the time, yeah. Yeah, Duke was a great place, yeah. It's also the place where I, ro I, I wrote a book. And it's funny because now people write a book because they want to go for tenure. And I think maybe my generation, people are more, students uh, or young people are more career oriented, like they know where they want to go. But for me, and I think my husband too, it was more like uh, we did whatever we thought was interesting. So I didn't work toward tenure because we didn't really have, it was not a requirement. But somehow I felt that there was a need for American lawyers to know how to proceed when they were confronted with a problem, either a service of process abroad or transnational litigation, or how do I know about the copyright in Japan? So what I proceeded to do was to write a book that took the whole of international and foreign law and put it into different categories, and then give pointers like methodology on how to go about it, where to find the, the fundamentals. So it was kind of a guide, 
more than a bibliography, but some bibliographic elements. And it even and a guide a for a U.S. attorney who yes. confronted this transnational element. Yes, yes, and it's yeah. it was it's still I published I, I, it's I published it for the first time in '91, and then it was regularly supplemented until 2006, and then now I have two uh, young librarians who are going to re reconceptualize it with my help, because you can imagine I started before the internet, so. It was hard to do research at the time. Mm -hmm. You know, now you start with the internet, but we started with what can you find in the uh, online catalog and go from there. So, but, so that was kind of a major uh, big book uh, called uh, Germain's Transnational Law Research. And uh, I was lucky because a lot of things probably in, in uh, everybody's life happen, either you call it forti fortuitously or serendipity, but one day, a man came to see me at Duke, and his name is uh, Wallace Baker, and he was the son. He's the son of the uh, Baker who founded the, what it is, is probably the largest law firm in the world, Baker and McKenzie, and he just happened to see my name that I was French, and his son was doing a, a master's degree in business uh, at the school next to the law school, which is the Fuqua Business School. So he was nice enough to write a preface to the book. So mm -hmm. I thought that would give it some cachet. And then I, <laughs> he was heading the office in Paris. So then we became good friends. And then I went to see him in Paris in his firm. So, so and the it, book is still alive, as you it, say. It's still alive. It's about to have a rebirth, perhaps. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And I yeah. think it will be good. It's both for academics, for students. But the idea was for lawyers to use it. So when it's going to be reconceptualized, it will be probably chunked up so that you can have the parts that you're more interested in, whether it's uh, how to do research in copyright or how to do research in um, corporation law or topics that lawyers are more interested in. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, and, and, and much influenced by the new information environment, yes, which I want to get totally, to. But totally, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, in 93 then, we lured you and Stuart uh, to Cornell. Mm -hmm. Uh, you to the law school, mm -hmm. and um, and there you were able to take the threads that you had already developed at Duke mm -hmm. and and really play them, um, mm -hmm. leading the law library for seventeen years, mm -hmm. um, creating a bridge to Europe, mm -hmm. um, both with a program in in, in mm -hmm. France and mm -hmm. a program at Humboldt. Yes, and uh, what. As you reflect back on that period of mm -hmm. 17 years, what were the, the, the great challenges mm -hmm. and the great satisfactions mm -hmm. of, of what you were able to do here? Well, you know, before I forget, I wanted to thank you, uh, uh, Professor Peter Martin, because you were chairing the committee which hired me. So I'm very grateful because I feel so blessed to have been able to work at Cornell, you know, for 17 or I think maybe even 18 years. It just, I was looking at, you know, there's a lot of documentation of, on what happened during this year. So yesterday I was looking at the annual reports of the library, uh, the Cornell Law Forum issues. So it's like, to me, when I reflect, it's like a whirlwind of uh, activities, of things happening every, every which way in the library, international activities with alumni. So the, the greatest satisfaction, it's hard to pick and choose. Um, you know, I, I worked with a few deans, with Dean Hos Osgood uh, hired me. And I think the reason I got the job, there was somebody who was much more experienced who uh, decided not to take the job. He stayed at Georgetown. And I was still relatively young. But I think what uh, maybe made the difference in my getting the job uh, was that I was tasked to look at the international and foreign law collection and see maybe you know what could be improved, how we could expand it. Because again, Cornell at that time, Cornell has an excellent reputation in um, international law uh, and foreign law. So I think there was a very rich collection, but maybe it was time to inventory, to expand it in different directions. So, um, so I was tasked with that, and uh, it worked out very well. Um, what I liked, and you know, one thing that attracted me to Cornell also, when I was at Duke, I was picking up books from a professor who had retired, Professor Larson, and he had 
taught at Duke at Cornell at some point, and one of the books that it was a yearbook where you could see the tower and kind of nice snowflakes, and it looked so romantic. And I was thinking, oh, one day I would love to work there. And so that that was the kind of my romantic vision. But I think the greatest satisfaction is to work for a place with a fantastic uh, library collection. And that's not a you know people may take it for granted here, but I've seen other collections and. It's really uh, top, top, uh, especially the, I fell in love with the rare book collection. And I know I was there more to modernize the library, but I, I can talk about the, the, the rare book collection is uh, just, I didn't pay attention before too much to uh, older books, but uh, we did wonders with it. Um, I think my greatest satisfaction was to enhance uh, faculty services to have kind of an individual relationship with its faculty and have the librarians have individual liaison, um, get to know what each faculty was working on and try to see how we could help them. And when we interviewed prospective candidates, you know, I gave them a tour of the law school and I said, we the librarians, we're gonna try to meet your needs but also anticipate what you may not even know, you don't know because our expertise is information, and if we know that you're interested in environmental law, then maybe we can try to find some new site or new book or new database that may uh, help you. So um, I think my, my predecessor, Jane Hammond, did a lot of work on the renovation of the building. She did a lot of work on the infrastructure, the library system. And I think my own contribution maybe was in terms of expanding services, not that they didn't have any services, but maybe in an individual way. Also um, teach, we started teach, teaching more, which I think is important, teach for uh, uh, some credit, like basic online uh, uh, 1L courses, also classes in, um, we had some in foreign international law and different aspects, business law. Um, so. My greatest, I mean, I had a lot of great satisfactions because, you know, the library was one. Um, I love to work with the faculty. I love to integrate the library into the programs. And I loved, it, of course, the international activities because when you could do well as a librarian and it helped the law schools, international programs, and, and they were like, uh, like unheard of opportunities, for instance, when we had duplicate books that we didn't need, like uh, reporters. But then friends wanted them, and that meant a lot to them for their research. So we shipped our books to the French Supreme Court, the Cour de Cassation, and then to the École Normale Supérieure, one of the best uh, um, university. And then in exchange, they, you know, they had a plaque. They recognized our, uh, uh, the friendship and the partnership between Cornell and the Cour de Cassation. They had a big ceremony. So, so it was kind of a, it was a very nice. We did some work for the French judges. We did some research for them. I know I, we did some research for a judge at the Conseil d'État, the Council of State, where he wanted, um, there was a lady who had been uh, uh, accused of uh, murdering her husband or something, and she fled to France, and then Texas wanted her back. So the French uh, court had to decide whether they were going to send her back. So they wanted to make sure they, they wouldn't put her to death in Texas because France, you know, doesn't uh, has abolished the death penalty. So it was kind of interested, interesting to uh, be I'm involved. I'm guessing the outcome of that. <laughs> <laughs> I think the Texas Attorney General promised they wouldn't put her to death. So I think she finally went back. But so it's kind of a, an interesting reference question. Yeah. So so th that was. Um, that was nice. Um, the challenges, I mean, I, I have many more uh, working with Well, the just following that particular yes. uh, line of, uh, <laughs> of, of thought, you were a key person for the, the Paris program, mm -hmm. um, which was blossoming during this period yes, of uh -huh. time. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing that was exploding in its scale and importance during this period of time was, was the LLM program. Yes, uh-huh. Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. so you, you were a key bridge person yes, for uh -huh. the school. Yes, and I got to know a lot of the LLMs, and uh, I think we have a, we had a very large number of French LLMs, maybe because of all the work that Jack Barcelo and others were doing with France. 
So, um, I, I, and I still have LLMs who write to me, so the holiday card. So it's very nice because they remember, you know, the, it's kind of nice for LLM to know that there's a person who also comes from a different country, so they feel more at ease to speak. And I had a special contact with the, um, the young French students and American students who came for the JD master's degree program because I was appointed the director of the dual degree program with France and then also with Germany with Humboldt. So I would go to France to select them and not really, I didn't have to go to Germany, they were already pre-selected. So I did that for several years. It was an innovative program. I think only Columbia and Cornell were doing it. Now maybe some other schools are doing it. And it was, I have to be a, a show gratitude also to a French professor, Professor Xavier Blanchouvent, who was a, a LLM a graduate from the class of 1951. And then he was the one who helped a lot with the summer program in Paris and also helped a lot with that um, dual degree program. Uh, so, and it worked so well that some Americans, after two years at Cornell, two years at Paris one, they got the dual degree, French and American, and they could take the New York bar exam and then take the Paris bar exam. And several American students passed it, which is really hard. So it, it was a, 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 a very successful, and I am in touch with, um, I'm still in touch with some of the graduates. Like one became a, a French judge, uh, Nicolas Michon, and then uh, I know Delphine is a lawyer in Paris. So it's very gratifying because they still write to me. So it's uh, very nice. Because of this bridge role, you were recognized uh, by the country of your birth. Mm -hmm. uh, you are a chevalier. Yes, yes. And can, you, can you talk about I, I see you that you're see, wearing the emblem. You can see that, but it's really funny because in the US one time they took um, an official photography, a photograph and they said, and they removed it because the photographer said, I think it, uh, it's in a way. So I said, no, no, put it back, put it back. So in the, it puts you in your place. You know, you think you're so, so, such a big shot and then they take it away. Or in the US, nobody pays attention. In France, when you go on the metro, on the bus, they look at it and they say, why not me? So, but, 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 but it was nice. I, uh, my grandfather had it, you know, it was invented by Napoleon to give like a little carrot to his soldiers. So in the past it was mostly for the soldiers and then now it's for um, a lot of people. And this is the first stage Then you can have higher uh, things. But it was a big honor because uh, of all the work I've done for um, to build bridges between the French and American legal cultures. And it kind of spurred me on to do even more so that uh, it worked well for me. So a lot of contacts with the French judiciary, negotiating with um, the French, the people in Paris one, helping establish the clerkship that is still mm -hmm. going on at the, started at the Constitutional Council, and then now it's in, um, uh, at the Conseil d'État, which is the uh, French Supreme Court for ad administrative matters, which is a big, much bigger deal than here. So, um, so, so that was uh, very gratifying and uh, one person who probably was influential were two people. Uh, one is uh, Sir Basil Marchesini, who is an English professor who came to teach here and a great friend of our law school. And the other one is a French uh, justice, who, uh, Mr. Guy Canivet, who was the, French, the chief justice of the French Supreme Court for civil and criminal matters, the Cour de Cassation. And then he was moved to the Council, uh, Constitutional Council and he came here to Cornell, you know, we invited him. And then I had him at the University of Florida just a few weeks ago, he came to give a lecture. So, so th those are kind of great uh, bridges. And one thing that may not be so well known here is that we may be the only law school who is actually not one Legion of Honor person and not two, but three, because Kevin Clermont received it and Jack Barcelo received it. So, so I think it's a, kind of nice, the cordial friendship and relationship between Cornell and friends. So, so I, I don't see them wearing their, uh, <laughs> their badge of honor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But as you say, I don't see them in Paris, so maybe yes, uh -huh, that's yeah. where they should wear it. Yes, yeah, yeah. So those were a great, uh, it could only have happened here because Cornell gave, gives everybody and gave me opportunities that I wouldn't have had in any other place. So 
I feel blessed. During your 17 or 18 years here, um, disruptive change was happening in mm -hmm. the field of mm -hmm. information science mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. uh, and, and law, mm -hmm. legal information. Yes, uh -huh. yes. Uh, I'd like to reflect a bit on, on mm -hmm. that and the challenges mm -hmm. it posed for you then and continue mm -hmm. yes. to yeah, well, pose for the field. People see it's a revolution, so is it a revolution or is it an evolution? I think it has both, both aspects. I think we, during my tenure, you know, we started cancelling print materials, but not to the extent that we are doing now, because we were waiting to have more stable uh, uh, environments. And um, so it, it was a time of transition. Uh, we put all the materials online, so everything was the online catalogue. Databases started uh, flourishing. Um, we did work, I think LI kind of led the way and really a lot of people knew Cornell Law School because of LI, so LI really put uh, Cornell Law School on the world map. And somehow it inspired us in the library, so we did things that were more appropriate for a library. Like we, at the time, universities were helping organizations, national and international, to, um, to maybe start websites to put their materials on, and then they had the strength to do it themselves. But we had contacts with the International Court of Justice in The Hague, with the ILO because of the relationships with the, from ILR, uh, uh, the school here, Industrial and Labor Relations. So we created, we had some help from uh, the law school and from the university and we created mirror sites for their webs. First we had a website for the ICJ, then they did their own. And we created mirror sites for the ICJ and the ILO because at the time, it was kind of a relay, you know, it was helpful. If they get too many hits, they get, so, so it, you know, now it's not so important anymore, but at the time it made a difference. Um, so we, we uh, engaged in that. I know um, we had uh, uh, Sasha uh, Skanderia, who was a refugee from um, uh, uh, Bosnia, and he had a PhD in informatics, and he created different websites for us. I was talking with Professor Ndulo yesterday and he reminded me that Sasha created a website for the Zambia um, Legal Institute and I think uh, uh, maybe not, not the LI, I think some kind of, a, he designed something else. And then I know LI has a big website for Zambia now. So um, we did, a, so what, how did we change? So, you know, at the time, when I was there, I still thought that, you know, maybe to be a flagship library, you needed to be a repository of print materials, you know, so that the other little libraries, maybe they could uh, throw theirs away and we would keep them. At the time also, the research methods or the, the habits of professors, they were still holding on to the print. I think this has changed so much now that it's right, it's the right time to cancel uh, I don't even think it's necessary to keep to hold on to print journals because if you have a stable uh, system like uh, the Hein Publishing Company, um, you can pretty much trust that they will um, continue or be sold to a commercial enterprise or you can hope that the law journals are going to be more open access and then you can get access to them that way. You know, so, so things have changed. But during my tenure, actually, we did help Hein the Hein Publishing Company is located in Buffalo, and we help them, Cornell, IT, and the law school library, we help them when they started Hein Online. They ask us, I think the CU, uh, Cornell, IT, provided the infrastructure, and we gave some user comments. You know, it uh, was kind of clunky, and, but we helped them. So we were there at the beginning, and they gave us free access for several years now. Uh, Cornell had to pay, but at the beginning, so, so, um, so we, we helped in those uh, uh, technological changes. Um, but, and then I, I did, um, we did something at my, um, um, yeah, we, we did something at my, uh, when I was the president of ALL uh, about authentication, because as librarians, the big worry was you can, you know, the states are stopping publishing their materials in print and they're going to go online and they're going to say the official publication is the online version. 
And that online version was only in Word. And actually in Florida right now, it's only the Florida Administrative Register and Code. It's only in Word. And it's the official version. They stop print. It's not even in PDF. So as a community, we librarians, we said, well, it has to be more authenticated. If you don't have any print, you have to have a digital signature. You know, you may say, well, Lexis and Westlaw, they're, they're good enough. But from a guardian of the official world for the ages, you want a little more security. So when I was president, and it has to do with, you know, canceling print materials. When I was the president of ALL, I commissioned a study to see which states had authenticated their materials and none had done it. So then my successor, Sally Holterhoff, and then uh, Barbara Bintliff, somehow we got the Uniform Law Commission interested, and they passed what's called a Uniform Electronic Material Act, which now has been implemented in different states, not Florida, unfortunately. And it requires some kind of a technological means um, so that these materials are authenticated. And then you can feel better cancelling the official state reports if they are still available or even expensive commercial reporters because you know that uh, the information is relatively secure. So that was maybe the, the side effect of this disruption in the technology. And um, as, as you acknowledged, uh, during the time you were here, you were president of the American Association mm -hmm. of Law Libraries mm -hmm. um, and also you took a leadership role in the international Body. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, you want to talk a bit more about sure. mm -hmm. those yes. it was dimensions very, of your time? Yes, it was very exciting because it, it was nice to be president. It's You get vice president for one year, president for one year. So it's actually you cannot hang on to your power because, you know, you don't stay for 10 years. But I wanted to be able, I don't like just to have a position to have it. I wanted to do something. So we did the authentication and it was wonderful. And we also did the, um, uh, something about legal research. We had a big meeting at the National Conference for stat State Bar Examination. I don't remember the title, but Erika Moser is the president. And we talked about the testing of legal research competency. And she said it was not a question of if, but when, because they have to develop thousands of questions to standardize it. But she said that one day, there will be a test of legal research competency on the bar exam. And that will certainly help increase the importance of legal research as a subject for students. Because what happens, it happened <coughs> here, it happened in Florida. The lawyers, when they see the young graduates, they don't really know how to do research unless they have a formal course in legal research methodology. Because in the digital world, it's so much more uh, complicated, you know, everything is everything looks the same, whether it's the black letter of the law or the commentary or an excerpt from a case. You know, sometimes they, they don't know what's what. So, so those were the two things that I remember from my uh, presidency. It was, uh, um, the big meeting was uh, in uh, St. Louis, Missouri. And um, I invited all my French friends. I had a French judge who came. I had my French from the, um, my friends from the, French Library Association who came and they talked on different topics. And uh, it was the centennial. And so it was kind of nice to have a foreign born person preside over the centennial. It meant ALL was kind of international. And um, uh, yeah, so, so it, 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 uh, ALL was a great experience. Also to remind me that we're just like, I don't know the English expression, but in French it's like a maillon dans la chaîne. It's like a chain and you're just a little piece of it. And then, you know, you do somebody, somebody else before you has done something, you do a little something and somebody else will continue. So that works very well in, the, in an active professional organization. So that, uh, that was good for ALL. And then I got involved in uh, IFLA. So IFLA is the International Federation of Library Associations. It's much larger. It's like over 5,000 associations and uh, individuals worldwide, not only law libraries, but when I was president of ALL, then I was able, I had a little impact. So I was able to kind of infiltrate it and say, go together with some uh, a German fellow and an English fellow, and we said we need to have a law library section in that uh, IFLA. 
and then we started that, so that law happened. library section, that happened. and it happened. That's yeah. your initiative. Yes, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I was not the only one, yeah. Yeah. I'm never the only one, but um, it started. And then we took kind of the authentication at the international level because, you know, some people like in Norway, they said, they're very smug, they said, we don't need uh, authentication because we trust our people. But if you talk about like a developing country, it's kind of easy to alter the, the, the content of a provision. So you may want to have a little security there. So we, we've uh, done a lot of workshops, uh, authentication and people like in Chile, they were influenced and they said they're gonna, Hong Kong, they're gonna try to do, uh, you know, different countries react in different ways. Some think authentication of digital legal materials is important. Some, you know, are not quite uh, uh, as conscious of it, but it, it kind of spreads. So, so I think it's uh, good for the future. So that was also a, a very satisfying experience. And now what is even better, I've ended my term, my five years or so, and I can see like it's blossoming. Other people are taking off and they're doing their own thing. So it's kind of nice to, to see that. So I'm happy about that. Um, as one looks across academic law libraries today in the United States, um, it seems to me that in the face of the changes in legal information, it, it's not at all, the role of law librarian mm -hmm. is, um, is a puzzle. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, what kind of background one should have for that mm -hmm. position, how one should relate mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. the leadership mm -hmm. of the school, mm -hmm. and how one relates to the university library mm -hmm. infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Do you have reflections on, on, on that puzzle? I mean, there, mm -hmm. there, there are important law schools that hire, hire people for this job who have no librarian mm -hmm. formal training. Yes. Uh -huh. um, then there's a whole question of whether the person should have a faculty mm -hmm. teaching mm -hmm. position or mm -hmm. research position. Mm -hmm. uh, and then how do they relate mm -hmm. to the university library mm -hmm. infrastructure? Mm -hmm. Yes. Any thoughts on, on where this is all headed or what, what the right kind of combination yes. is? Yeah, yeah because of my uh, um, I was going to say ripe old age, but I'm going to say my vast experience. <laughs> I have a lot of <laughs> thoughts now, and I, I've, I've worked in uh, three different libraries. Right. I haven't moved around that much, right. so Duke, yeah. Cornell, and uh, Florida, Florida, University of Florida since 2011. So, um, and it will be interesting to see when I retire again, because I, I'm retired from Cornell, but when I retire from Florida, what, avi what advice I may give to the dean at the time, if they're interested in my advice. Um, for me, for me, the, the major role, you know, it depends on if you talk about the director or the librarians, but just in general, the formal role, the most important role, the fundamental of the law librarian at any level is to help faculty with their scholarship, support them in a proactive way, and then um, help students become proficient researchers, do a lot of teaching. So sometimes I think that librarians, the profession is becoming too technology oriented, to like about the little apps or the latest technology, this, that, rather than the substance, the content. So what I call the fundamental role is what I call scholarship plus, and it's like a takeoff on what John Palfrey talked about. He was the librarian at Harvard at some point and a guru of digital information. He said digital plus, but to me it's scholarship plus, and the plus, it doesn't matter. Then everything else, if you focus on the scholarship, and the teaching and helping faculty, the rest is a means to the end. And what I call by the rest is organization of information, cataloging, um, uh, using the latest appropriate technology, being innovative, it's all a means to the end. So I don't want that to be lost. The, I don't want librarians to lose track of the fact that they are, most of them are lawyers as well as librarians, so they have the knowledge, the substantive knowledge, and they need to use it. You know, I, so for that, it means that you may have fewer people, but more qualified. And as far as uh, um, the relationship with the law school, it's essential for each librarian, and especially the director, to be fully integrated with the programs of the law school. You know, it used to be that you could be self-standing, you know, everybody came to you to look at the shelves and so on, but this is no longer, you look for information, you don't, I mean, 
a lot of stuff is still not in the internet, so you need to look, uh, and it's not the books haven't all been digitized, so you still need books, but you're really looking for information, not, uh, uh, no matter what the format is. So I think um, you need to be, as it, to, to be like a player at every activity in every area. Uh, and I'll give you an example because it's working out beautifully at the University of Florida with our new dean, uh, Dean uh, Rosenberry. Like, she's asked, uh, because somehow she got a good impression of what librarians can do in terms of uh, finding information. So we have a faculty development committee. There is a librarian there to just chime in or help. Um, you know, we, we do the SSR and the B Press, but maybe other areas. We have, um, we're looking at the strategic planning, like so there is a law school strategic planning committee, there is a librarian there. We have a committee on, a law school committee on messaging and social media, there is a librarian there. So you see, we, and librarians have um, com special competencies that uh, we don't realize that are such a plus for the law school, like we, we are very organized, we know about organization of information, so it's part of our job. Uh, we're team oriented. We always want to collaborate with other people. We, you know, we, we don't. We're not so individualistic. We look for the common good because we don't have an axe to grind. You know, sometimes faculty are interested in their research, but we look at the big picture. So, I think, and it depends on the culture. But the more the librarians can participate at the table with the director of communications, the director of career, the director of um, uh, social, social, you know, other areas, the development person, um, that works uh, well. So it's really um, the re in relationship to the law school and the uh, leadership of the law school that uh, works best. For the director, it's essential to be part of the senior uh, leadership team, otherwise you're not at the table. Um, whether the librarian, the director should have a faculty status, I think it depends if they deserve it or not. Uh, have they published? Have they, uh, um, have they written books, uh, articles? Are they capable of? Do they want to? Um, you know, I, I just did a, an ABA inspection at a school where the librarian could very well do it if they wanted to, but they decided that they don't want to work so hard. They were offered either do you want a tenure track appointment or um, a lecturer with five year renewable contract? And the person said, I prefer, they could have both. They could have either, they could, but they said, I prefer that. Now, for myself, I would always want to be a, a full faculty member because you are at the table, you're respected. Um, but I think it may vary and it may not be necessary. I think. Um, I think you have more influence and impact. You're seen more as a peer if you're a, a full faculty. But as you say, um, some schools some have decided that uh, they prefer to have a senior administrator, an associate dean, rather than a, a, a full professor. And it's actually quite challenging to do both, mm -hmm. to work for tenure and also to, um, to be a full-time librarian because it's, you know, you, you talked about satisfaction, but it's also, there are challenges. Uh, so, so it's a full-time occupation, especially the management of people. They say management would be easy if it were not for the people. <laughs> <laughs> now, you, you left Cornell for, for the University of Florida. You'd been at two fine private schools. You went to mm -hmm. a fine public institution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm assuming that that made a difference. In other words, that you've encountered some issues and some um, some, some constituencies uh -huh. at the University of Florida that you mm -hmm. didn't have here. Am I right about that? Would you talk a bit about the fresh perspective that this yes. uh -huh. this job in, in Florida has given yeah. you? Yeah. Well, it's a the University of Florida is a much larger school, so you have more students. Uh, um, it's a state school. I don't, you know, we don't, it's not in a big urban center, so we don't need any security guards. So as far as people coming off the street, there are not that many. So it's, it's not so different in that regard. It's, uh, um, 
maybe uh, I'm going to talk about something silly, but there are fewer, uh, fewer uh, food events <laughs> because the state uh, cracks down more on spending money on food. So, <laughs> so less free food for faculty. But more but football. <laughs> more football, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I haven't seen too many differences, though. Um, you know, it's a large campus, the, the College of Law. Um, but, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a nice place. It's a Spanish moss. Uh, the, the students have taught, uh, uh, I taught a seminar in French law, and the students were as bright as, uh, of course, they are self-selected because, you know, they're interested, so may, but they were as bright as the uh, Cornell students. Um, maybe a difference is that uh, under Dean Jerry, who is the dean who hired me, and now under Dean uh, Rosenberry, the school is really trying hard to move up in the rankings. So I think I like, that was one of the reasons I wanted to go, to try to contribute. It's kind of uplifting when, you know, people are, are using the team spirit and trying to, um, uh, uh, to do even better. So uh, it's a little hard because they, are, they have a larger student body, so it's, a, it's hard for the student-faculty ratio. So. And there are resource constraints of a state and there are institution these yes, days. Yes, that's yeah. right. Yeah, we may not get as many uh, uh, raises. Yeah, but I think now, you know, I, I started a trend. I'm just joking because uh, provost, the provost here, came down to become President Fox at the uh, University of Florida. So there may be a trend, and the provost at the University of Florida is a Cornell uh, uh, graduate. He has a PhD in mathematics. So. So, but I think the new president Fox and the new dean, they're doing well with the legislature and I think they're doing well uh, for the university because there are big plans too. So I haven't, uh, um, you know, I haven't seen any drastic differences between uh, Cornell and, uh, and, and UF in, in, the, in the money. As far as the relationship with the university, I, I love the model at Florida because we, um, I have a great relationship with the university librarian. Uh, we collaborate. There is actually a tenure system for librarians, which is run by a committee of mostly the university library. So they get tenure through the library system. You know, my tenure is in the law school, but there's so they are tenure track, which they like tenure track faculty. So we collaborate a lot. We buy databases together. Uh, we on, we serve on committees together. We use their HR when we need to. We have our own HR, but they give us advice. But the big difference is that we have separate budgets. So, um, uh, and I think that leads to mutual respect and a sense of boundaries. And I think it makes our relationship um, better in a way. Um, uh, and, you know, I know it, the model, different models can work in different ways, but. Uh, I, I, I like the current situation because, as I said, I see the university librarian uh, Judy Russell reg regularly, and uh, no friction, just uh, a mutual support. And she's very supportive when you know we have some issues, and they give me advice. Like if I have, a, I talk to the HR person. I had, a, yeah, I won't go into it because it has to. <laughs> not, not on camera. It, it has, it has to do with tattoos. So. <laughs> Whether, yeah, so I stop right there. <laughs> We're at the point in the conversation where I'm going to say, Claire, what haven't we talked about that you would like to talk about as you reflect back well, on? Let me see. I have a little sheet here but because I put some names of people I yeah. wanted, I didn't want to forget. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, in my, my oh, I've, I haven't talked about um, the relationship with alumni because that was, you mm -hmm. asked about the mm -hmm. pleasures of satisfaction at Cornell. It was just wonderful because I got to know the alumni. They were very generous with the library and they were loyal and we had a great time. So Jack Clark gave a lot of money to the law school and to the library. And when we moved down to Gainesville, he, had a he had still has a house in Gainesville. So we got to see him and his uh, wife. And then now they moved to Sarasota to, uh, I don't remember if it's, a, it's not Sarasota, it's a, a Naples. But we still see each other regularly when he comes up. So it's a nice friendship. Shep Gurian gave a nice, nice endowments. Uh, Mr. Rosenblum gave nice endowments. Lee Weintraub from Miami 
uh, became a personal friend, so we still see them from time to time. So that's a pleasure. And one thing that I wanted to mention about friends also is that one time we had a big law alumni meeting thing in the early 2000s in Paris, and um, a French senator taking care of uh, people, uh, French people outside of the US opened the doors of the Senate, and we had a big dinner at the Senate. So that was very nice. And, uh, and I did become a US citizen. So Judge Rillehan, who is the uh, Cornell graduate, presided over my citizenship, so I'm a dual citizen now. And uh, I could go on and on because to talk about things, uh, I made many friends. I still have wonderful friends at, on the Cornell faculty. I'm currently working with Val Professor Valerie Hans on the French and the Belgian criminal jury system. And uh, I'm very good friends with uh, Kevin Clermont, who is a Francophile and good supporter. I was very friendly with um, Ted Eisenberg, who passed away too soon, and um, uh, Bob Hillman, and uh, the George and Deirdre Hay. So I, I, uh, I remember my time at Cornell with very fond memories. My parents were involved. They gave parties for the faculty when we were in Paris during the summer program. My mother got to know a former dean, um, Grey Thoron. They had lunch together. So it's a... Um, Cornell has been a huge part of our life. Our son grew up here, uh, Nicola, and of course my uh, husband, son and I, we enjoyed life. So it's a pleasure to be back here for this interview. And I would like to thank you for doing this and then also thank Femi Cadmus, who is the current Edward Cornell librarian for extending the invitation. It has been a pleasure. Well, it's been great for us too. So thank you, Claire.